back, back to the good old days. Let me take you back, back to the good old days. Let me take you back, back to the good old days. Let me take you back, take you back to the good old days. Let me take you back, let me take you back, back to the good old days. Let me take you back. Salo falava, malo le sue fua, moa male langi e mamma. Mi sembo le vinaca che mi saca na wakanda mai viti. Hello everyone and welcome to Talano Watupe. This is a show where we celebrate and highlight Pacifica's success in all its many forms. Each week we sit down with a different Pacific thought leader to hear about their journey and learn from their experience. Our guest today is Pacifica trailblazer, Lua Manuval, Dame Winnie Laban. Lua Manuval made history in 1999 when she became the first female Pacifica MP. In 2018, she was appointed a dame for her services to education and the Pacific community. And for the last decade, she has worked as Assistant Vice-Chancellor Pacifica at Victoria University of Wellington. I'm looking forward to today's Talanoa because Lua Manuval was one of the most influential Pacifica women I knew of growing up. Her representation in Parliament had a tremendous effect on the aspirations of Pacifica women at the time. And she is someone who actively mentors the next generation of Pacifica leaders. Before we sit down with our guest, let's see how we go with our Blue Pacific quiz. How well do you know the countries in our beautiful region? Let's find out. Kia ora. Talofa lava. My name is Tuasiri. And my name is Telesia. And, and we, we are members of... of the Pacific, Pacific Social, Social Justice, Justice League. League. And we're going to give you a quiz on our Blue Pacific. Let's go. Can you tell us which country this flag belongs to? Can you tell us the capital of this country? Can you tell us the name of the leader of this country? And lastly, can you tell us what currency they use in this country? Stick around to the end of the show so we can compare our answers. See you soon. Thank you, Telesia and Tuasivi. Up next, it's our segment on Pacific literature presented by Leilani Tamu. Talo falava, malo lele, fakalo falahia tu. My name is Leilani Tamu. I'm a poet and an editor, and I'm passionate about Pacific books. The book that I'm going to speak to you about today is called Langakali and it's an important book of poetry by one of our most beloved and important Pacific writers, Professor Kornai Halutharman. This book was published in 1981 and although it's small, it's a very, very important collection. It includes 29 poems and for me each of the poems is so important because they speak to the journey of a woman who has traveled between Tonga and New Zealand and Fiji and across the Pacific. And it's about her journey of understanding and reflecting on what has occurred in the Pacific over the time of our history. The book for me is important because it contains uh, real courage and beauty and reflection. And I'd like to speak to you about one of the poems, which is my favorite. It's a short one called Take Off. I'll read it first. What was it you thought when the moon swam out of the sea? I thought I caught a glimpse of you. When was the first time birds learnt to fly? It was, I know, when I began to write. This is a stunning book of poetry. There are metaphors in there. It calls to the ancestors, but it speaks to the present. I love Langakali. 
If you'd be interested in reading more of my reviews or even contributing a review, please check out my website. Thank you. Tafsay Lavalelani. After the break, we're joined by Pacifica Trailblazer Lua Manuval Dame Winnie Laban, who is the Assistant Vice Chancellor Pacifica at Victoria University of Wellington. Welcome back to Talano Watupe. We are here in the studio with Pacifica Trailblazer Lua Manuval Dame Winnie Laban, who is the Assistant Vice Chancellor Pacifica at Victoria University of Wellington. Welcome to the show. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Um, many of our guests have mentioned that you were a very inspirational Pacifica figure to them growing up. So we're really excited to share your insights with our viewers. No, thank you. And, um, you know, I think that we've been influenced by the generations that have come before us and I think we continue to carry those values mm. and those qualities with our work and also with the present and future generations. If you could elaborate on that a little bit more and tell us about your family. Your parents moved to Wellington from Samoa and laid a foundation for you and your brother Ken. Can you tell us about the values they instilled? Yeah, sure. Well, Mum and Dad came in 1954. Uh, from Samoa. Uh, they were both the eldest of large families, um, both 10 each with cousins that kind of joined the ranks of 10 up to about 15. So mum actually came as a scholarship uh, from Samoa when she was 19 mm. uh, to do shorthand typing and from St Mary's College in Apia. And at that time, girls were encouraged only to go for teaching, shorthand typing or nursing. Mm. And Dad worked as a public servant, and they decided to come and live um, in Samoa. And I think it was at that time where New Zealand was seen a pla as a place that provided well-paid jobs or good-paid mm. jobs, uh, education and opportunity. Um, you know, for them, but more importantly for their children. So they, they came in 1954, they got married, and then my brother Ken and I came along. And like many of my generation and others, our parents were hugely active um, in the community, um, in the church. And at that time, there wasn't a large Pacific community. So they really were the forefront leaders that I think broke the glass ceiling to provide a voice uh, with government and other players around what our needs were mm. and also advocacy around issues for employment but immigration. And uh, so a lot of that journey was being part of a family where your parents were not home a lot. Uh, mm. They were very active um, in community service alongside others of their generation mm. that were courageous, that left home uh, to come to New Zealand. So they were pioneers in their own right? Yeah, and alongside many others. Mm. And I always enjoyed this great sense of connection, um, of community, but respect for the diversity of Pacifica. Mm. You know, that we weren't only Samoan, there was Tokelau, Tonga, Cook Island, Fiji, Niue. And so there was a sense of family and community and connection between uh, the different Pacific Island groups and a huge respect uh, for each other, but acknowledging the strength of being part of a collective mm. that was united though diverse. Yeah. So your parents already had very good jobs when they moved here from Samoa and then they sent you to Erskine College. How was that experience? That's right. Well, it was interesting because though my parents went to Catholic schools, um, we weren't Catholic, we were sort of brought up congregational PIC Methodist, but our family are a mix of religions mm. and, and many are active and many are not active. But um, Erskine was an amazing school because it was a girls' school and I think there were only two other Pacific Island girls and two other Māori at the time when I went there. Mm. But I think I've always had a strong faith, like I really believe in, in God 
and in a creator that reminds you about vulnerability with being human mm. and about what is important in life. And there was a nun called Sister Pabst who was in her late 70s and she was the first woman to get a Masters in Law in New Zealand wow. and she was an amazing teacher. I was one of those kids that didn't concentrate very long on anything but she took me aside and I got top history prize in the sixth form which was amazing but just a wonderful educator and I think for me he was a nun who could have become a judge who could have had her own legal firm mm. but chose to work in a girls school uh, to influence generations of girls but the values of choosing that life uh, to, to work and, and, and support others, I think really influenced me profoundly. Mm, yeah. And just that service and giving back. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because I think we all have those inspirational teachers in our, um, in our past, someone who made us want to learn. That's yeah. right, that's right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I love the power of spirituality. I love the quiet times to meditate and reflect when we live in such busy mm. lives now. I think the importance of, of, of reflection and prayer um, is, is important uh, to me and it was very important to my parents mm. and my family in which we were brought up with. Yeah. So in your early career, you were a family therapist mm -hmm. and a community development worker. That's right. So in your experience, um, what are the things that families can do to help children to become prosperous? Yeah, I think that um, family dynamics are interesting because you have different personalities. And, you know, it's many generations and there are different views. You know, but family also is an amazing source of strength and that I always say to our young people um, that, you know, it's not about me, it's not about the I, it's actually about the we and that we come from ancestors and families where the dream to succeed, the dream to dream. Mm. Um, is very important and that we are strong because of the support uh, that our families can give us. Um, there are tensions in families too, you know, there's a lot of judgmental positions and views that sometimes our people take and it's important I think to work with young people and encourage them to dream, mm. uh, to, to be creative and to guide them. You know, and much as it's difficult, I mean, I, I remember my time when I found what my parents thought um, unreasonable. But when you reflect on when you're a bit older, you're actually grateful because that guidance is given out of love. Mm. And, and sometimes you have to allow your children uh, to grow, you know, and uh, much as we worry that they might make the wrong decision, I think at the end of the day, um, they can also think that my, my, much as I might have done it my way, um, it might have been the wrong decision to make, but at least your family is there with you all the time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think there comes a point where you just have to trust that you've given them the values and the tools and that they have to make their own decisions. That's right. And it's very hard because, you know, I think, I don't know whether it's traditional, but sometimes our parents can suffocate their children and mm. that it's important to just work alongside them and encourage them to grow because I think there's that pressure to do well. It's the immigrant dream for your child to succeed yes. and sometimes there's pressure mm. and um, it's just a matter of trying to unpackage that. So in 1999 you smashed the glass ceiling and achieved something that no Pacifica woman had before when you entered Parliament. Mm. Uh, what was the moment that you um, felt the calling to be a politician? Yeah, well, you know, I felt that it's been long overdue. Uh, at that time when I went into Parliament, there were three Pacific men that were in Parliament and they were all from Auckland. Um, we come from a long line of very strong mm -hmm. Pacific women leaders. Just think about our mothers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they were formidable. Um, I think New Zealand missed out on generations of women and other men that could be, could be in those leadership type roles. 
I actually was approached um, when I was 34 years old to run for parliament and I didn't choose to run till I was 44. And it was largely because um, at that time when National were in, there was an Employment Contracts Act which did not have any respect for workers' rights or unions. And um, a factory closed in Wainui Amata where many of the people locally, including Pacific, worked and there was no support for them mm -hmm. as workers, redundancy, um, you know, uh, or an opportunity to upskill and get jobs and many of them were men and you know particularly for men you know you, your ability to earn an income and to have a job or a paid job to support your family and I know times have changed that has a terrible psychological emotional impact mm. um, on them mm. and when I saw this um, and saw the, the crying because it was this whole issue you arrive at work and you find you get told you're no longer required there's no support for you. And um, I thought, this is unjust, this is not fair, this should not exist in New Zealand. And so that was when I thought, because I've been asked lots of times, but I was driven by the pain and the emotion and the loss of seeing these human beings who've worked hard all their lives being told that they were no longer required. And many of our people had gone through that with the factories closing. General mm. Motors, Ford Motors. There was no plan to upskill these human beings who were leaders in our community and in our churches. And so part of the reason why I thought that I would accept the opportunity to go through the rigorous selection processes um, to run was really a dream mm. to work with others to put this right. Mm -hmm. Mm. So you were really driven by the service aspect? Hugely, and mm -hmm. I, think, I think my whole life has been steep in service, steep in social justice, mm. and we have been brought up to understand what is right and what is wrong, mm. to have the courage to be principled and, and, and to stand up and give voice when, when things are not, are not right, they're wrong. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah. So during your term in Parliament, uh, you received a cancer diagnosis. That's right. So what did um, battling and defeating cancer, yeah. um, you know, what insight did that give you? Yeah, well, Tupiu is special because it's the first time I've let everyone know that I had a bilateral mastectomy. So the whole thing of, and I was a minister at the time um, in the Labour government, when I was told that I had breast cancer, that I had to go into chemotherapy in three weeks, that the tumour was, was huge. Um, for me, it was really hard to hear, but you realise the frailty of, human, of being human. There is strength in being a human being. No one is immune from cancer. No one is immune from COVID. And it was just that whole thing of coming to terms with it. Mm. And I also went public because many of our women were afraid to go for mastectomy, uh, not mastectomy, sorry, for um, the test mammograms, yeah. uh, for the tests. And I think a lot of it is, it could be that thing, they're very ma about their bodies. And, um, you know, that that's very a private type thing, which is still alive and well mm. um, in our community. But the reason why I, went, I had to go public was I had a leadership role. I didn't want rumour and gossip to circulate about something that may be true and may not be true with people. And so I wanted to put that history right, but I was more concerned about that this was an opportunity to go public to encourage women to go and get tested mm. early, you know, with mammograms, so that, um, you know, prevention, uh, early, early intervention is important. So, so I was going through, and that was an election year as well, chemotherapy, radiation, uh, mastectomy, uh, but I'm a very driven person and I'm very Pacific, very Samoan. I don't like losing. I had an election to think about 
And so losing the hair and having a wig and everybody saying I look fabulous <laughs> was all part of it. I, I think for me it was just setting that goal of of still continuing to live, continuing mm. to, to be strong. And even going for chemotherapy, it was interesting because just sitting with people and, and just talking through. But I think remaining really positive and having a strong spirit, I think, um, also really helped. And, mm. you know, and my mother um, found it really hard, but she was very strong. And I think that, was also, that also helped me through. Yeah. It must have given you, um, I guess, an amazing perspective on life, right? Yeah. To to go through that. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've I've never taken life for granted, and I'm I am a driven person. I I'm, I have very high standards and expectations, which sometimes is probably not the best thing, because we are human. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am I, I realise that life is precious. And you can only do what you can do and have the courage to dream and make it happen mm. while you're here. And uh, so I think it's that spirit that, of the experience that taught me about not taking life for granted. Mm. We have to go to a break now, but when we come back, I want to hear more about uh, your role as Assistant Vice-Chancellor Basifika at Victoria University. Yeah, that's fine. Welcome back to Talanoa Tupe. We're here in the studio with Lua Manuval, Dame Winnie Laban. Lua Manuval, 10 years ago, you stepped down from your seat in Mana and joined Victoria University of Wellington. Can you tell us what was behind that decision? Um, I have a huge affection for children and uh, for young people. And I felt being in opposition, and they normally do it in New Zealand for three terms, would probably do my head in. <laughs> and um, I felt a little guilty because I'd won the election again in Mana, so I caused a by-election. But this, and I was looking for something where that would give me fire in my belly. So Victoria University of Wellington advertised an assistant vice chancellor for Pacifica, and it was the first time that a university in New Zealand um, introduced a role mm. like that. So, um, my husband said to me, well, you know, you don't seem to be very sort of lively where you are at present. Why don't you apply? So I did, and um, I got the role. And I think the reason was that I think you need to be in charge of your destiny. But also, I've always been concerned about education. I've mm. always wondered why, um, to be blunt, Māori and Pacific young people don't do as well as European and Asian at university. So again, the dreamer decided uh, to move to university and it was an opportunity to work with our young people mm. and their families, but also to work with academia, but to look at a system that I feel still continually does not deliver. Um, as well as it should in terms of lifting success. Mm. So I've never looked back uh, to pair. I love working with the young people and the other thing, they're a great source of intelligence mm. as to what's going well at university. I care deeply for them and I want them to aim high, to work hard and do well. So there's a line that I use with them to inspire them if you don't work hard and you don't plan and aim high, uh, you will not be around the board table, you will be on the menu. Yes. And we have to encourage our, our young people, but our people to, to aim, for, to own your own business, to be the CEO, mm. uh, to be the Minister of Finance and mm. Foreign Affairs and Trade, you know, to be the Mayor of Auckland. Uh, that we also can be round that table. And it's not only Pacific people and families that benefit, New Zealand benefits mm. uh, from that. So that, that was really why I wanted uh, to go into this role. Mm. And, you know, I still have amazing energy for it. Yeah. So in addition to your role, you're also, you also sit on many boards, so mm -hmm. Creative New Zealand, the Institute of Judicial Studies, and the Public Service Whale for the Public Service Commission. 
we still need more Pasifika um, around the board table. What is your advice for those who are wanting to get into governance? I think for a start, we need to be around the table. Uh, public service governance is, is an interesting one because you have elections every three years. So a lot also depends on ministers, but also the will of the public service to work at good relationships that are about trust and about good faith and openness. But governance is essentially about accountability and uh, about transparency. Um, with public service, it's, it's taxpayers' money, so you have to be able to ask the right questions and do the scrutiny that's required. Um, you know, with business, it's also very similar in terms of ensuring especially legal frameworks are, are complied with and not only about asking the hard questions, but you also bring a Pacific perspective to decision making and policy making and program output so that we can ensure that our people get their share of the goodies. Mm. And uh, we still need to grow that. And by doing that, we need to encourage our people uh, to make themselves available, to do the necessary training if required, uh, to be considered to be appointed to boards. Mm. And uh, that's a very important role. Mm. So you mentioned um, at the university, uh, one of your drivers is working with students to improve education outcomes. There's also um, a lot to be done in terms of representation on academic staff for Pacifica. That's right. So. Um, in 2017, there were only 20 postdoctorate Pacifica employed at universities across New Zealand compared yeah. to 575 for Pākehā. Um, wh what's, uh, wh what needs to happen in order mm. for us to have more Pacifica in academia? Yeah, and that's a really good question because and another statistic is only 3% of uh, Pacifica are lawyers mm. are, are in, the, in the law area. For me, it's growing that front end and it's growing that aspiration um, t to be an academic, um, the importance of succeeding. It's a tough competitive edge with university. They, you have to have a high GPA with your undergrad degree. You've got to go through postgraduate and PhDs, but we really need to grow Mm -hmm. academics and professional staff in the decision making, teaching, learning and teaching and research roles. So I, I totally agree, I, it's not good enough. And I think universities and um, everyone who's involved need to do more. Mm. So as well as your work um, for Pacifica in New Zealand, um, you're also involved with the Public Service Valley, which is looking more broadly across the region. Can you tell us about that work? Yeah, sure. So um, since 2004, the Public Service Commissioners from the region, this is the Pacific region, Melanesia, Micronesia and Polynesia, have been meeting. And Australia and New Zealand are part of that group. Mm. And uh, last year when they had their conference in Wellington, they said that they would like more support than just meeting and uh, asked if New Zealand could look at funding a project um, to help build leadership in the public service in the region and amongst public service commissioners um, and also to, to build uh, capacity and capability. And uh, so the Ministry, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Winston Peters at the time announced um, a budget of 20 million for five years. Uh, but what happened was when this was announced, COVID came in. So in the meantime, we've had to shift to connectivity, uh, to IT, mm. but also they've appointed a team. Tanya Ott has been appointed to Deputy Commissioner. It's based in now the Public Service Commission, that was the State Services Commission, that won the terrace. And so they're focusing now on engagement with, with each of the Pacific Nations, the Public Service Commissioners, but also to respond to their requests around codes of conduct, um, you know, public service remuneration, uh, recruitment. But the other issue for me is it's really important that we from New Zealand don't think we know it all. Mm. 
um, that uh, there is a lot of experience and knowledge within the respective Pacific nations, but also leadership. And for me, it's very much a combination of the two. Mm. Um, and, and I'm really loving that project because as we said right from the beginning of the interview, it's all about public service. Mm. And the role of the state has an important role yeah. uh, in governance. Mm. So recognising New Zealand's place as a Pacific country and as part of the region, um, can you tell us about your um, the advocacy that you've been doing to ensure that there is a Fale Malai built in Wellington? Yeah, sure. And I think that <clears throat> one of the things I wanted to signal is that, you know, there's a lot of conversation around the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, <clears throat> for me, Polynesians, including Māori, have had a, an ancient kin relationship mm -hmm. that goes back to Tangaroa. Um, but the, the whale really has been work that our parents started mm -hmm. um, about having a place in the capital city, Wellington, of New Zealand where it could be a place of belonging for Pacific people and all peoples, but more importantly for our children and future generations. But it signals to the region that Aotearoa New Zealand is of the region. She does not sit outside or on top mm. um, of the Pacific. And that's why that place, which will be a place for the arts, for our events, our independence ceremonies, um, for education, our community uh, will be a great place. Mm. Yeah. Well, Manuval, you've been a trailblazer and a Pacific leader for many years, and your husband, Dr. Peter Swain, has also been serving the Pacific um, in the development space. Can I ask, what brought you two together? Yeah, um, I think a passion for justice and also Pete's background uh, was in social work training and men for nonviolence and management so <clears throat> we both have a huge love for the region which is our home and he's Palangi from Christchurch and he it's interesting how he identifies he said much as my ancestors came from Scotland and England at the end of the day I'm also a man of the Pacific and this is where I think we can symbolize that connection in our children in our relationships uh, which celebrates mm. um, us being together and that support from family, um, including Peter and my brother Ken, um, ha has been amazing and I'm, mm. I will forever be grateful for that. Awesome. Yeah. I uh, did uh, want to touch on something else because, as I mentioned at the beginning of the interview, uh, a lot of the women who've uh, been on the show already have mentioned that you were one of their role models. And uh, you talk a lot, um, I've, I've heard you speak before on um, succession planning yes. and the importance of bringing people up. Mm. Yeah. Succession planning is really important. <clears throat> Just like the previous generations of women uh, before me, our mothers, you know, our aunties and, and grandmothers, including our men, because for me, they're an integral part of us as well. It is really important that we work collectively to grow more um, Pacific women and men um, in decision making type mm. roles. I'm really strong about that and that succession planning also means that you know when to step aside. Mm. Uh, that it's time for others to come through uh, which I'm always encouraging and that you can also do other things and so we have to really look seriously at where we currently are and how we can actually advance and accelerate that. Well, yeah, thank you so much because um, I think sharing your story today will just give people so many different insights about um, pathways that they didn't know were open to them. So thank you for sharing your pearls of wisdom. And it's a pleasure to appear and it's lovely to see women leaders like you coming through. <laughs> <laughs> thank it you. encourages me and all of us. Yeah. I actually have a few more fun <laughs> questions that I'm going to ask. Fun questions. Well, Manuva, what is your favourite uh, go-to karaoke song? Ah, uh, simply the best. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Can't go past Tina too. <laughs> Who was the most influential Pacifica person you knew of growing up? Uh, my.
my mother. Yeah. If you weren't in your current profession, what would you be doing? Uh, community work. Mm. If you could invite any three people in history to a family dinner, who would it be? Um, Tupe Tanoai. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we can make that happen. <laughs> Kamala Harris. Yeah, and Audrey Lord. And finally, how do you want to be remembered? Uh, just um, about being courageous and realising your dream and the importance of lifetime servanthood with leadership. I love that. Yeah. Uh, Lua Manuval, thank you so much for coming to the studio today to share your insights. We've learnt so much from you and I'm sure our viewers have as well. And thank you for being someone who reaches out and encourages uh, other Pacifica people who are coming up through the pipeline to be all they can be. Yeah, and thank you Tupe, and thank you to Sayoriana for the opportunity. In our next segment, we talk about communication strategies for parents. Let's hear from the Martin Houters Foundation Trust, which has been running parenting courses for the last 10 years. My name is Marita Solomon. And I'm Tale Solomon Moore. And so for the last 10 years, we've been delivering a parenting program um, that focuses on a different idea each week to help our parents um, build more positive communication and bond with their children. Uh, because parenting is the most important job that one will ever do. However, our precious gifts do not come with a manual. So that's our aim each week to build more positive communication and bond. The tip for the week is you are your child's first role model. Everything you say and do, they will copy. All your strengths and weaknesses, they will pick up. The way you answer the phone, the way you talk to others, your work ethic, the way re you receive good news and bad news, the emotions you express, they will copy. Your children are watching and learning from you. Self-talk, self-care, self-regulation are great coping strategies to show your children how you cope with life. You can say out loud and in front of your children, I can do this, I can ask for help, I've got this. You can care for yourself by exercising regularly and treat yourself, have a me time. You can self-regulate by taking deep breaths and go for a walk. Thank you for joining us. If you would like to know more about Martin Houters Foundation Trust, you can like our Facebook page and see the details on the screen. Thanks for that tip to help all our parents out there. Next up, the answers to the Blue Pacific Quiz. Welcome back to the PSGL Quiz. Let's compare our answers. This flag belongs to Tuvalu. The capital of Tuvalu is Funafuti. The currency of Tuvalu is the Australian dollar. The leader of Tuvalu is Prime Minister Garcia Natano. Thank you for joining us and hope you did well. If you want to join the Pacific Social Justice League, Follow us on our social media platforms. Mother. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Now to end our show, we have Soul Brown and the Soul Sisters. See you next time on Talanoa with Tupe. Like you gave me your heart and suddenly ripped mine away But it feels so good that I would Let you have it if you want it even if just for a day You're like magic, you abracadabra all my pain away Got me underneath your spell and well I suppose 